<clears throat> All right, let's get going. <clears throat> so last night we took a nice little detour away from topological spaces to talk about metric spaces, right? A metric and a metric space, you use a metric to construct a metric space. You can think about metric as like a distance function, essentially. I've been gone for two weeks. Ah, huh. well, that's what we covered last time. So now we're jumping back into full blown topological spaces. And now we're going to introduce another property of topological spaces called connectedness, whether or not a topological space is connected. So far, we've only talked about one topological property that a topological space can have. Actually, we've talked about two. One is whether or not it's Hausdorff. That was a topological property. The second one we briefly touched upon is whether or not it was, let's see if I can say this word, metrizable, which means it could be derived from a metric space. That was another property a topological space could have. We didn't go that deep into that section there. It was just mentioned as a, as a side note. So now we're introducing a new topological property called connectedness. Uh, we're going to introduce two different notions of connectedness. Our first notion of connectedness, it's easier to think about it being disconnected than connected. So we're going to think in terms of it being disconnected. What does it mean for a topological space to be disconnected, roughly speaking? It means I can split it into two open sets. If I can take my topological space and split it completely into two open sets, then it's disconnected. If I can't do that, then it's connected. That's going to be our first idea of connected. Our second idea of connected is going to be what we call path connected. This will be what we get to next week. And path connected will be my topological space is connected if for any two points in the topology, I can connect them by some path. So you might think North America is connected to South America. There's a path that you can take on land to get from North America to South America. North America is not connected to Australia. There's no path you can take on land to get from a point in North America to a point in Australia. So that will be path connected. That's what we will cover next week. So that's the high level intuition for these two notions of connectedness. The first one we'll be talking about is the set notion of connectedness. So with that intuition, let's dive in exactly to the definition. So let x tau be a topological space, then one. We say x is disconnected, we can split it up, if there exists u and v as open sets in x. So u and v, those are open sets, they're in tau. Remember, tau is our collection of open sets on x. So if and only if there exists two open sets on x such that together they give you all of x. So if I'm saying x can be split into two open sets, then together those two open sets better give me back all of x, right? So their union is all of x. Their intersection is empty. So if I'm going to split x into two open sets, I don't want any overlap. I want every point in x to either be in this set or in this set. That's what we mean by we can separate it. It's disconnected. And u can't be an empty set, and v can't be an empty set. If we allowed one of the sets to be empty, then every single topological space would be disconnected. Because I could always split it into the entire set X and the empty set. Because those would both be open. So, cover that one more time. X is disconnected if and only if there exist two open sets in X, such that their union gives you back all of X. That's an equal sign. Their intersection is empty, and both the sets are not empty. Feel like you got it? Draw a picture of it really quick. What does that mean? So here's my x. When I'm saying that that is disconnected, I mean that I can somehow separate this into two sets, u and v. So that u and v together give me back all of x. u and v have no overlap. If a point's over here in u, it's not in v. If a point's over here in v, it's not in u. And u's not empty and v's not empty. I can't pick as my choice. I'll use all of u for this, and v will be the empty set. That's not a valid way to show it's disconnected. Feel like you got it? OK. Two, we say x is connected if and only if it's not disconnected. So every topological space is either connected or disconnected. Has to be one or the other. This isn't like open and closed. Remember, a set can be open, or it can be closed, or it can be both, or it can be neither. When we're talking about connected and disconnected, it's either one or the other. And then finally, from up here on one, should have put this one above that, we call u and v a separation on x. 
So when I split x into two sets u and v, we call u and v a separation of x. OK. So there's our basic definition that we'll be using for the next section. Now let's get very concrete, discrete examples. So here's my set x, the set a, b, c. And here's my topology on it. Remember, any little circle there represents an open set. So I'm saying B by itself is an open set. I'm saying B and C together is an open set. I'm saying A and B together is an open set. And I'm saying A, B, and C together is an open set. And then obviously the empty set's an open set, but can't draw that. So here's a topology. Here's another topology on ABC. Question, is this connected or disconnected? It's connected because it, um, we can't split it into two open sets. Yeah. So it's disconnected. You're right. It's okay. disconnected. We can't split it into two open sets. Oh, sorry. I'm saying it wrong. It's connected because we can't separate it. We can't disconnect it. So it's connected. What about this one over here? Connected or disconnected? Uh, probably disconnected. Why do you say that? Right, C by itself is an open set, and AB is an open set. So here's your U and V. U's open and V's open. Neither of them are empty. Together, they give you back all of X, the entire set, and their intersections in. So this would be a separation on this topology. Good? Now let's look at the subspace topology on the open interval, negative 1 to 0, union with 0 to 1, so the blue right here. And this is going to be a subspace of R with the standard topology. Remember what a subspace topology is? Space within uh, space. How do we get open sets in our subspace topology? You take any open set in your Super space topology, or whatever you want to call it. So here's an open set. Here's, I'm going to draw in red an open set in the standard topology on R. Here's an open set in the standard topology on R. Therefore, an open set in the subspace topology would be the intersection of this with the set that we're talking about. So that means that this right here to here is an open set in the subspace topology. Okay. So, a question. Is this subspace topology connected or disconnected? Why did you remove the other sign? Uh, I didn't. So it's this set right here. Negative 1 to 0, it's in blue. Oh, okay. Negative 1 to 0, union together with 0 to negative 1. Or 0 to 1. OK, okay so question. Is that connected or disconnected? I would think that it's disconnected because if you take 1 to 0 and 0 to 1, when you union them, you get the entire subspace. And when you intersect them, you don't have anything because it's not including 0. Yeah, perfect. Maybe this is a little would help. My x in this case is equal to this set. That union that. That is my x. And it's a subspace of the Serenic Claude on R. So notice that this set by itself is open in x. How do I know it's open in x? Well, because it's open in the Serenic Claude on R. And so if I take this set, which is open in the Serenic Claude on R, and intersect it with x, then I get that exact set. And so that set is open in both x and r in this case. But it's open in x. So this is an open set in x, and this is an open set in x. That set, how many elements are in this set? An infinite amount, so it's not empty. So that's not empty, that's not empty. Their union, 
obviously gives you back all of x. And do they have any points in common? No. So they are a separation on x. So x is disconnected. Let's do another example really quick. What about all of R with the standard topology? So all of R with the standard topology. So we're talking about real number lines. All of R. Is this connected or disconnected? It has a standard topology, so what are open sets? Any union of open intervals AB. That's what our open sets look like. I would say connected. Connected? There's no way I can split this into two open sets. Oh, is that the, yeah. the, the, the limit there? Okay. Uh, yes, you could. Real easy, right? Just pick a point like zero, and then we take all the points over here. That's an open set. We take all the points over here. That's an open set. And so we just split all into two sets, right? And that's what makes Except it. Except that is an infinite set. That's okay. We split. So u is everything over here, and v is everything over here. Let's see. Does that work? Well, okay. u is not empty. V is not empty. Take their intersection, and what do you get? This is where I don't understand. You're not including the zero. Oh, perfect. Yeah, this doesn't work. We didn't get zero. So this is not a separation. Because u union v is not giving me back all of r. How do I get zero? One of these sets needs to have zero. If I include it in this set over here and make that closed interval, now v is not open set in r anymore. So R is connected. Your intuition was right. So R is connected when X is this subspace of R. X is now disconnected. Which is what you would have guessed intuitively. All right. Let's try another one to keep stretching your intuition. I'm going to do the discrete topology, x with the power set on x. Remember what the power set on x is? Every possible subset of x you can create. So I've got x together with this power set, where the size of x is more than 1. So it has at least two things in there. Maybe rather than saying more than 1, maybe greater than or equal to 2 would help keep it more clear. There's at least two things in x, maybe more. Why do I say there's at least two things in X? So that we can split it into at least two sets that each have an element. All right, question. Is this topology connected or disconnected? I disconnected it well. Well, the fact that you have the absolute value of x makes me wonder if x could be like a, a negative. And oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. This, <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is a big x right here. And this is when you put sets in between the brackets like that, that means the size of the set, how many things are in the set. Oh. So this has nothing to do with absolute values of real numbers. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So we're doing x together with its power set, where x has at least two things in it. So x could be an infinite set. x could be a set containing a, b, c. x just has at least two elements in it. I would say it's connected. It's disconnected. Because if you have the empty set, and just your two things, then you can separate it into those two things and just union it. So you're thinking in the case, let's think through, let's say that X is actually just two things, like A and B. Not including the X set. Well, that's X. Our topology, the power set on X, what's the power set on X? The yeah, power set on X in this case would be equal to the set containing, okay. we have the empty set, the set containing A, the set containing B, the set containing A. and the set containing AB. So here's our topology. Here's our set. Can I find two open sets that create a separation on X? I guess, yes, you can. Yeah, in that case, you can. Okay. So when X had two elements, 
What if X had three elements? Then you would eventually get. Then still, I just pick one that has two of them and one that has one of them. Yeah. What if X had a thousand elements? Then Doesn't matter. Pick one set in there. So here's how we do it. We would say one. Let A be any proper subset of X. So in other words, A can't be all of X. Where A is not empty. So if X has at least two elements in there, then I can always find a subset of it that has at least one thing in there. So a proper subset, meaning it's not the whole set, where it has at least one thing in there so it's not empty. You with me so far? Two. Then A and A complement are a separation. Since A was a proper subset of X, there must be at least one thing in X that's not in A. That's what it means to be a proper subset. You can't be the whole thing. So that means that there's at least one thing not in A. So I know A has at least one thing, and I know A complement has at least one thing. What's A union A complement? Uh, All of X. Take everything that's in A and everything that's not in A, and you get back X. Similarly, what's the intersection of A and A complement? The empty set. The empty set. I want everything that's both in A and not in A. That's nothing. So there you go. That would be the simple proof to prove that this is, in fact, Disconnected. The power set of a set is disconnected. Right. Exactly. We refer to this topology as a discrete topology. Because you break up all your open sets into individual discrete sets, single element sets, ultimately. So that's why it's called a discrete topology. Okay, let's look at our other favorite topology. The trivial, the trivial topology. X together with the trivial topology, the topology that just contains X in the empty set. Is that connected or disconnected? Connected it's connected. It's as connected as connected gets. You can't even split it into two non-empty sets. There aren't even two non-empty sets, open sets, to split this into. Right? All right, let's do one more. We're going to look at the subspace R minus P as a subspace of R with the standard topology. So I'm going to take the real number line and I'm going to puck out one point. P is just some number. 187. I pluck out that point. Is our subspace connected or disconnected? Disconnected. Disconnected. Because this set over here is an open set in R. And so it's going to be an open set in R subspace topology. This set over here is an open set in R. So it's going to be an open set in our subspace topology. So it's already split into two open sets. It's the exact same thing can we use it up here. They're just bigger sets. Well, kind of bigger. Kind of the same size. They both have the same infinite number of elements in them. <laughs> okay. Feel like we've got some intuition ready to prove some stuff? Let's jump into our first proof. X is disconnected, so we can split into two open sets. X is disconnected if and only if there exists a proper subset of X such that it's not empty and it is cloped. It is both closed and open. So a set is, a topology is disconnected. If I can find some set in there, that A, not all of X, B, not empty, and C, both open and closed. If I can find that set, then my topology has to be disconnected. And this is an if and only if proof. So we're going to go both ways. I'm going to show that if X is disconnected, then there is an A that has all these properties. Sorry, that's a proper subset sign. That's not a C in case that was confusing. This is a proper subset. Simple. So I'm going to show if X is disconnected, then there is some A that has all these properties. And then I'm going to show that if there is some A that has all these properties, X is disconnected. So let's go this direction first. 
Assume x is disconnected. What does it mean for x to be disconnected? It means that there exists u and v in its topology such that u union v gives you back all of x, u intersect v is the empty set, u is not empty, v is not empty. Okay, so assume x is disconnected. That means that there exists u and v in our topology such that u is not empty, v is not empty, their intersection is empty, and their union gives me back all of x. You with me? Now, notice that u is v's complement. U and V are complements of each other. Everything that's in U is not in V, and everything that's in V is not in U. And together, they give you back all of X. So U is V's complement. So U is the complement of an open set, which means U is closed. That's what it means to be closed. Your complement is open. So U is open by definition. Furthermore, since U is an open set's complement, U is closed. So U is open and closed. U is open. So we found a set, U, that was open and closed and wasn't empty and wasn't all of X. Now we're going to go the other direction. Let A be a proper subset of X such that A is not empty and A is open. It's both open and closed. Then A and A complement, let's see, since A is open, a complement is open. open because A is closed. Since A is closed, A complement is open. And since A is open, A is also open. So A is open and A complement is open. You see that? They're both open and closed. They're both open. They're both open and closed, but the point is they're both open. Their union gives you back what? By union A and A complement, I get back all of X. And since A was a proper subset of X, that means it's not an empty set. then that means A complement is not empty. So I know A is not empty. I know A complement is not empty. They're both open sets. So they form a separation on X. Maybe sure that one more line. Therefore, X is disconnected. Why is there always only two separations uh, for them to be? It seems like it would be impossible for there to be multiple disconnections for that to be considered disconnected. And it seems a little strange. If it's connected in at least one way, it may be connect disconnected in multiple ways. Let me uh, help your intuition really quick with that one. Let's imagine that we're looking at a subspace of R2, so I can draw on the whiteboard. So here's my space. It's these points, together with these points, together with these points. Here's A. So those three things union together, and we're looking at ourselves as a subspace of R. Or of R2. Okay. Now, this is disconnected. This is like uh, triply disconnected because I can split it into three sets, three open sets, but it's also just disconnected because I can split it into two open sets. I, I just. Um... Okay, so. All of those three sets are disconnected from each other, right? A is this set. Yes. And and those um, there's th there's two dis there's I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. So U, my U. So let me name this set and then uh, this big set here. Okay. So I may call this set over here uh, U prime, and I may call this big set over here V prime. You with me? Now, by definition, what is an open set in our subspace topology? You take an open set in R2 and intersect it with our set. If I take U prime and I intersect it with A, what do I get? I get this set right here. So that set by itself is open in the subspace topology on A. Similarly, take V prime, this is open in R2, intersect it with A, what do I get? I get this set union with this set. So that is open in our subspace topology. So this is open in A, and this is open in A. So we split A into two open sets. The set containing these points, and the set containing these points. Okay. So it's disconnected, which is what you were against. So you're saying you can apply this logic to 
all of these uh, multiple different disconnections, you can always like boil down to disconnects. Yeah, if it's disconnected in multiple ways like you're thinking, then we can boil it down to two disconnections. We will have a second concept of something called totally disconnected, which is you can basically break it down into its biggest connected pieces are going to be singleton point sets. Any set bigger than that won't be connected. So we'll get to that. That will be one of our last concepts we cover for today. Okay. okay, anyways, so we talked about this. Now we're going to do an example. This time we're going to do R with the lower limit topology. So in other words, its basis elements look like this. A together with B. The standard topology, our basis elements were open brackets on both sides. In our lower limit topology, we include the A, but don't include the B. That's what our basis elements look like. You with me? Question, is R with the lower limit topology connected or disconnected? I apologize, could you uh, ask that question and reframe it? So the standard topology on R our basis elements look like open intervals A, B, right? Now we're looking at the lower limit topology on R. So our basis elements look like this. So any union of things that look like this are open sets. So is it going to be connected or disconnected? I'm going to say connected, but well, no. Yeah, well, it will be disconnected. Let me try asking a different question. Let's look at this set right here. It starts at zero and it goes off to who cares when. Right. Is this set open? You said it was, but it should be. It's, well, I'm just asking, is it open? Uh, Not is it connected, is it open? No. Going back to open and closed. It should be. Is this an open set if this is our basis elements? Can I union up a bunch of these things to get this? Well, yeah, you should be able to union up a bunch of those to get... Uh, this right here is a basis element. Right. This is a basis element, looking at the picture. This is like 0 to, I don't know, 4? Right. Maybe it's like 4.12 with the 2's repeating forever. Whatever. Doesn't have to end for uh, an integer. This is a basis element in the lower limit topology. Okay, so repeat your question. <laughs> so my first question was, is it open? Well, okay. If it's a basis element, then yes. Then yes, every basis element is open. Okay. Furthermore, any union of basis elements is open. Right. So imagine I took this set, union together with this set. So the blue here, is this an open set? That together with that? Yes. Yeah, it's a union of basis elements. I would need two basis elements to get that. Let's say I extend this all the way to infinity. Is it still an open set? This together with this extend to infinity? Yes. Yes, because we can take an arbitrary union of these things. I can take the one that goes from 0 to 1, union it with the one that goes from 1 to 2, the one from 2 to 3, the one from 3 to 4, and union all infinitely many of those up and get this. If it can be expressed as any arbitrary union of basis elements, it's open. Okay, so we got open. So now let's go back. And let's think about this. So here's some random point A, here's some random point B. And we're looking at this set. This time we'll draw our set in red. Okay, question. Is that set open? Yes. 
Yes, it's a basis sign. Now let's look at its complement. What would its complement be? Its complement would be everything from negative infinity to A, union together with everything from B, including B, to infinity. Right? That's the complement of this thing. Is its complement open? Is this piece open? Is this piece open? Yes, I can take the set, so A is just some number, right? So I take the set, A minus one up to A, and I can union that with the set A minus two to A minus one, and I can union that with A minus three to A minus two, and so I can slowly build backwards, 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 all the way to infinity. Union all infinite of those up, and you get this. So this is open, this is open, the union of open sets is, open. So the complement of this is open. Which means that it's closed. That it's closed on open. It's closed in which means that it has sets. Hmm. Interesting. Which means that the topology is closed. No, this, this set is open. Oh. So the topology, what is it? Is it connected or disconnected? Disconnected. disconnected. A topology is disconnected if and only if there exists one of these open sets. Now, that was a hard way to think about it. We could have thought that this topology is disconnected in a really easy way. It's obviously disconnected because here's how I can split it. Go to zero. All right, all the numbers from here going that way, that's an open set, call it V. Now, not including zero, going backwards this way, call that U. U and V are both open and they create separation. Everything that's not in U is a V, everything that's not in V is in U. Their union together gives me back all the bar. Neither of them are empty. We're good. So it was easy to separate it. But we were trying to use it as an example of this theorem in action. OK, next definition. These next two definitions are going to be a little subtle. You're going to feel like I'm telling you the same thing twice. <laughs> so we'll go over them and then try to explain the subtle distinction between the two. All right. So the set A as a subset of X is said to be connected in X if and only if the subspace topology on A is connected. So when I look at A, if A is this set and we're viewing it as a subset of R2 with the standard topology, this is a connected subset. Because I can't take A and divide it into two open sets. Because any way I try to divide A, if I try to split into two open sets in A, so I pick my dividing line here, and I try to call this U and this V, the question is who gets the boundary? If I try to give this boundary to V, then V's not open anymore. If I try to give it to U, U's not open anymore. So if this red circle is A, and we're thinking about being as a subspace of R2 with the standard topology, so our basis elements are open balls, then this would be connected. So we would say that A, this set, is connected in X. So the set, A as a subset of X, is said to be connected in X if and only if the subspace topology on A is connected. Okay. Let's look at an example. If I let a equal negative 1 to 0 union together with 0 to 1 as a subspace of R with the standard topology, then this is now a disconnected. So a is disconnected in R with the standard topology. We already showed that that topology was disconnected. So let A be this set, give it the subspace topology it gets from R with the standard topology, and we can split A into two open sets, into two open sets that are open in A. That is open in A, that is open in A. Okay, now you're gonna feel like I'm saying the same thing. Let X tau be a topological space and let A be a subset of X. 
If there exists u and v open in x, so u and v from tau open in x, such that a is a subset of u, oh sorry, a is a subset of u union v, u intersect a is not empty, v intersect a is not empty, and u intersect v intersect a is empty, then u and v are a separation of a and x. Let's look at a picture and then get used to this again. So here's my potential A. It's these points over here with these points. U here is open in X. V here is open in X. Notice that U and V happen to have some overlap. This is still going to be a separation of A in X. Because there is no point in A that is in both U and V. Every point of A lands in U or V. It shows up in one of the sets, and it only shows up in one of the sets. So, we have four requirements for U and V here. First off, A had to be a subset of U union V. So, all of A had to show up in U or V. A is a subset of U union V. That's condition one. Condition two, U intersect A has to be non-empty. U has to have part of A in it. I could have done V has everything, and U just has these points over here which aren't part of A. Some of A had to show up in U. And similarly, some of A had to show up in V. V intersect A has to be non-empty. And finally, it's not that U intersect V can't have anything in common. It's that U intersect V intersect A can't have anything in common. I can't have something that shows up in both U and V if it's in A. If it's in A, it can't be also be in both U and V. A point in A can be in U, and a point in A can be in V, but it can't be in both of them. So if the point is in A, it can't also be in U and V. I can't have a point in U and V and A. It can be in U and V, it can be in V and A, it can be in U and A. Or in other words, this overlap here can't actually overlap into A as well. Where U and V overlap has to be completely outside of A. Is there a specific reason why I, I, I didn't catch that? It's going to be a definition. Oh. We're defining what it means for U and V to be a separation of A in X. Because now we're using open sets in X. Notice U is not open in A. And V is not open in A. They're not even in A. U intersected with A is open in A. V intersected with A is open in A, so that's small set. This set by itself is open in A. This set by itself is open in A. But U here is not open in A. V here is not open in A. So up here, we were talking about sets in A. Here, we're talking about sets in X that still give us a separation on A. And one of our, our next theorem here is going to be to prove that these are logically equivalent ways of thinking. That if I can get a separation of my sets, if I can get a separation on A in X, then I'd be able to get a separation of A in A. And vice versa. If I can get a separation of A in A, then I'd be able to get a separation of A in X. So it's, it's a little subtle, the distinction there, where our open sets are coming from. That's why we want to prove that these two are saying the same thing. That way we can kind of ignore that subtle distinction. And we know if we got one way, we've also got the other. Make sense? The difference? Okay. So let's jump into this definition. So A is disconnected in X. That's what this definition gave us. A is disconnected in X, what this says, if and only if it has a separation in X, which is what this gives us. This is the case if and only if this is the case, is what we're proving. Okay, so let's go the forward direction. We're showing that if this definition holds, if A is connected in X, oh, sorry, if this doesn't hold. 
So if A is disconnected in X, this was the definition of connected. What does it mean for it to be disconnected in X? This isn't the case. Okay. So A is disconnected in X if and only if we get a separation. So I'll start by assuming A is disconnected in X. What does that mean? That means that there exists two sets, U prime and V prime, in the topology on A. Not in the topology on X, in the topology on A. So this U, and, U prime and V prime are going to be a separation on A. There are going to be two open sets in A that separate A. Not open sets in X that separate A, open sets in A that separate A. All right, so assume A is disconnected in X. That means that there exists U prime and V prime open in A, such that U prime is not empty, V prime is not empty. When you union them together, you get all of A, and when you take their intersection, you get the empty set. Just exactly what it means for topology to be disconnected. Okay. Now, if U prime is an open set in A, and A is a subspace topology, what does that mean? U prime is in the topology on A if and only if there exists U in the topology on X such that U prime is equal to U intersect A. That's what it meant to be an open set in the subspace topology. You take the open sets from your superspace and intersect them with your subset. That's how you create your subspace topology. So by definition of a set being open in A, that means that there exists some set that's open in U, such that our set that's open in A is equal to our set that's open in X intersected with A. So that's what I'm going to say next. So since these two sets are open in A, then there must exist U and V open in X, such that U prime is equal to U intersect A, and V prime is equal to V intersect A. You with me? Okay, then U and V are a separation of A and X. Let's make sure we understand that. First off, is U, do I know that U is uh, not empty? Yes, because it has U prime in it. Yeah, because U prime is not empty. And U prime is a subset of A. So since this isn't empty, here's a better way to say this. This isn't empty. And it's everything that's in here and in here. So U can't be empty. Because if U is empty, then U prime will be empty. U prime is everything that's in U and A. I know U prime's not empty, so U can't be empty. Similarly, since V prime's not empty, V can't be empty. So we got that. Second, what else do I know about U prime and V prime? I knew that their union was all of A. So if U prime union V prime is equal to A, then I know that if I take everything that's in U prime and A, and I union it with everything, maybe put parentheses here, and I take everything that's in V prime and A, what do I get? A. I get back all of A. U prime and V prime are subsets of A. So intersecting them with A doesn't change anything. That was kind of a dumb thing to say. What I meant to say, here's a better way to say it, is if I take U and I intersect it with A and I get U prime, taking U and intersecting it with A could have only made U smaller. It could have made U bigger. Oh, I'm way over explaining this. Sorry. We're checking that we have these properties. <laughs> awful, awful. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Reset. What are we checking? I need to check that U and V have the properties given here. So first off, is A a subset of U union V? What is U? It's everything that's in U. U prime is a subset of U. V prime is a subset of V. Everything that's in U prime is for sure in U. Everything that's in V prime is for sure in V. And since U prime and V prime together give me A, 
then A must be a subset of U union V. There's a better way to say it. Okay. So since U prime union V prime is equal to A and U prime is a subset of U and V prime is a subset of V, that gives us that A must be a subset of U union V. Follow logic there? Okay, so we've got this property satisfied. Second, U intersect A better not be empty. U intersect A is just U prime, not empty. Okay, V intersect A better not be empty. V intersect A is just V prime, it's not empty. Finally, U intersect V intersect A better not be empty. Better be empty. Better be empty, thank you. I already know that U prime is equal to U intersect A, and I know that V prime is equal to V intersect A, and I know that U prime intersect V prime is empty, which means that U intersect A intersect V intersect A is empty. U prime is this, V prime is this. And intersecting with A twice doesn't change anything. So U intersect V intersect A is empty. Okay, sorry, I'm thinking the wrong definition. Subtle, easy to get confused. Hopefully I cleared up all the confusion after I confused you. You get it with going that way? So I showed that if we're disconnected using this definition, then we have a separation using this definition. Now I need to go the other way. I need to show that we have a, if we have a separation using this definition, then we're disconnected using this definition. Okay, so let's go the other way. So let U and V be a separation of A in X. So U and V now look like this picture. Here's my U, here's my V. They potentially have some overlap. Okay, let U prime equal U intersect A. So what's U prime? Take U, intersect it with A, and this right here is my U prime. It's U intersected with A. And this right here is also my V prime. It's V intersected with A. So <laughs> let U prime equal U intersected with A and V prime equal V intersected with A. And now notice that U prime is not empty. How do I know U prime is not empty? U and V are a separation of A and X. What does that mean? It means U and V have all these properties. And one of the properties is that U intersect A is not empty. So that gives me U prime is not empty. V intersect A is not empty, which gives me V prime is not empty. Uh, a is a subset of U union V. And so if I take U union V and I intersect it with A, what do I get? A. You just get back A. If A is a subset of U union V, then U union V intersected with A just gives me back A. And that's exactly what U prime union V prime is. That's U intersected with A, union V intersected with A. They give me back just A. And then finally, I knew that, right, this one to the side, well, don't really need to write it, right here. I know that U intersect V intersect A is empty, therefore U prime intersect V prime is empty. Because U prime is U intersect A, and V prime is V intersect A. So when I intersect all three sets together, I have to get an empty set. Therefore, A is disconnected next. All right, so I don't know what's going on there, but good to see the difference. Any questions on any of that? All right, let's move to the next one. Our next theorem is going to be that continuous functions preserve connectedness. Before we show continuous functions preserve, not homeomorphisms, but preserve house door. If one topological space is house door and you write through a continuous function, 
the resulting topological space is still housed door. And maybe let's remind ourselves, what does, uh, what's the definition of continuity? What does it mean for a function to be continuous? What's the high level way to say it? What's the high level way we describe a topology? What does a topology give us? It gives us a structure to talk about what? Proximity. Topology enables us to talk about proximity. It enables us to talk about things being close or not. And so continuous functions preserve proximity. Now the way that they do that is the pre-image of open sets are open. That's the exact definition. What does it mean for a function to be continuous? First off, it doesn't make sense to talk about function being continuous unless it's a function from a topological space to a topological space. Otherwise, the concept makes no sense. What do we mean by functions continuous? We mean the pre-image of open sets are open. Okay, so if x is connected and the function f from x to y is continuous, then f of x is connected in y. This might be worth drawing a quick picture for. So here's my x. Here's my y. And I run x through some continuous function f. When I run x through the function, it might not give me back all of y. It might just give me back these points right here, which is what we mean by f of x. When I get when I run all of x through the function, it may not give me all of y. So if x is connected, then the subspace of y, f of x, is also connected. That's what we're saying. So we're not saying if x is connected, then y is connected. We're saying if x is connected and f is a continuous function, then what you get when you run it through the function is connected in whatever space it comes out of. So a little bit careful there. All right, so if x is connected and f from x to y is connected, then f of x, the image of x, is also connected in y. And sorry, I never wrote this line, so I added it after the fact. One, let x be connected and f be continuous. Now we're going to do a proof by contradiction. We're going to assume by way of contradiction that the thing over here is disconnected. So I'm going to assume by way of contradiction that I can split this into two open sets in y. So I may assume by way of contradiction, I can split this set into two open sets in y, column b1 and b2. And then I'm going to look at the pre-image of v1 and v2, which are going to be over here in x, v1. And I may call the pre-image of v1 u1. So this is going to be u1, this is going to be u2. And so u1 and u2 are going to give me a separation on x. But I know x is connected, so that's my contradiction. So assume by way of contradiction that f of x over here is disconnected. I'm going to use that to prove that x is disconnected. Contradiction. Because x is connected. So let x be connected and let f be continuous. Assume by way of contradiction that f of x is disconnected in y. And I'm going to leave, that's going to lead me to say, therefore, x is disconnected. Contradiction. And so we're going to be done when I get to this line. See a big picture how we're going to go about this? Okay. So assume by way of contradiction, f of x is disconnected in y. That's just like a over here was disconnected in x. If f of x is disconnected in y, then that means I can split it into two open sets in y that have these four properties such that my entire image is a subset of their union. When I intersect with one open set, we get something non-empty. When I intersect with the other one, we get non-empty. And when I intersect all three, we get the empty set. Basically replacing the A over here with this F of X. And that's what we're doing. Okay, so assume by way of contradiction that F of X is disconnected in Y. Then there must exist two open sets in Y, V1 and V2 in the topology on Y, 
such that v1 intersect f of x is not empty, just listing out these properties, but not in the same order. So that is that. So v1 intersect f of x is not empty. v2 intersect f of x is not empty. f of x is a subset of v1 union v2. Remember, my f of x is functioning just like my a did over here. And then finally, v1 intersect v2 intersect f of x is empty. v1 and v2 may have points in common, but they don't have any points in common that actually land inside my set. Okay. Da -da -da. And I want to name the preimage now. And let u1 be the preimage of v1. And let u2 be the preimage of v2. So basically, have this picture set up now. Okay. So then I know that u1 isn't empty. How do I know u1's not empty? Because it's the preimage of v1 intersected with f of x here. It's the preimage of all these points. So these points right here on this side, maybe I'll write it in red. These points over here are v1 intersected with f of x. These points over here are v2 intersected with f of x. And f of x was the entire blue thing over here. So f of x was the entire blue thing like that. So since v1 intersected with f of x isn't empty, then u1 can't be empty because it's the preimage of the sink. Some of these points had to map over here, otherwise this wouldn't be an image. What does it mean to say that a point landed over here in f of x? It means it came from some point over here that mapped over here through f. So if there's a point here, there had to be a point here that mapped to it. So since v1 intersect f of x isn't empty, u1 can't be empty. Similarly, u2 can't be empty because this set's not empty. So I know u1 is not empty, I know u2 is not empty. Finally, I know x is a subset of u1 union u2. How do I know that? u1 is a preimage of all of v1. Here's how I know that. f sub x is a subset of v1 union v2. So the preimage of this so the preimage of this set is a subset of the preimage of this set. So since f of x is a subset of v1 union v2, then x is a subset of u1 union u2. But u1 is a subset of x and u2 is a subset of x. So I showed x is a subset of u1 union u2, and I already know that u1 union u2 has to be a subset of x because they're open sets in x, and so x is equal to u1 union u2. Okay, so I got u1's not empty, u2's not empty. u1 union u2 gives me back all of x. And then finally, let's look at u1 intersect u2. u1 intersect u2 is the exact same thing as u1 intersect u2 is intersect x. If I take this set and this set and intersect it with x, it doesn't change any of those sets. Because they contain all the points in x. So intersecting with x doesn't change anything. And that is equal to the preimage of v1 intersected with the preimage of v2 intersected with the preimage of x. That's what those are. What is x? It's the preimage of f of x. What is u2? It's the preimage of v2. What is u1? It's the preimage of v1. And I know that the preimage of all these sets when I intersect them together has to be the empty set because, where did I write it? Right here v1 intersect v2 intersect f of x is nothing. And what's the preimage of nothing? Nothing. So therefore, x is disconnected. We showed that u1 and u2 have all those properties. When you intersect them, you got the empty set. When you union them, you get all of x, and both of them were not empty. So we got, therefore, x is disconnected. Contradiction. Because we said let x be connected, therefore, x is disconnected. Contradiction. Therefore, continuous functions preserve connectedness. All right.
Next one. Let x tau be some topological space, and let c be a subset of d, be a subset of x, where c is connected. So, we've got, here's our whole topological space x, here's d, here's c. So c is a subset of d, is a subset of x. If u and b are a separation of d, if I can separate d into two open sets, then c has to be entirely in u, or c has to be entirely in v. If it's possible for me to do a separation on d, let me draw a picture where it would be possible. Say d was these points together with these points. So d is this together with this. c is a subset of d, but c is connected. So then if I can do a separation on D, split it into two open sets, like this set and like this set, then C has to be entirely in one of those open sets. It can't show up in both of them. Otherwise, C won't be connected. So in the picture, that would be a potential U and B. So that's what we're going to prove. You see the picture? Make sense? Yeah. All right. So let's prove it. So one, uh, assume, assume by way of contradiction. Oh, sorry. I need to start with let U and B be a separation of D. So one. Let U, V be a separation of D, comma, and assume by way of contradiction that we don't have this. Now, how do I ne negate an OR? How do I negate alpha or beta? No. I'm assuming by way of contradiction the opposite of this. Not alpha and not beta. Not alpha and not beta. So assume by way of contradiction, oops, that's my eraser, that C is not a subset of U and C is not, is not a subset of V. What does it mean that C is not a subset of U and C is not a subset of V? It means part of C has to be in U and part of C has to be in V. U and V together give me all of D. U and V are a separation of D. Everything in C is inside of D. If all of C is not in U and all of C is not in V, then, well, not all of it is in U. Some of it can still be in U. We're saying it's not the case that C is a subset of U. We're saying that there's something in C that's not in U. And if there's something in C that's not in U, where is it? It has to be in V, because U and V are a separation on D. And everything that's in C is in D. So, if C is not a subset of U, then that means that there's something in C that's not in U, which means it's in V. And, since C is not a subset of V, then there's something in C that's not in V. Which means it's in you. It means if you intersect it, you don't get the empty set. Perfect. Which gives me that C intersect U is not equal to the empty set. C intersect B is not equal to the empty set. Uh, U, sorry, C is a subset of U union B because U union B gives me back all of D, and C is just a subset of D. And then finally, since U and V are a separation of V, they have no points in common. So C intersect U intersect V has to be what? If I take everything that's in C and in U and in V, what do I get? V? Or C 
set these at intersections. Sorry, the empty set. You should. The empty set. Yeah. Okay, so we get these four conditions. Notice what we have here. Do we have that if and only if? Do we have that C is a subset of U union V? Yep. Do we have that U intersect C is not empty? Yep. Do we have that V intersect C is not empty? Yep. Do we have that U intersect V intersect C is empty? Yep. So that gives me that U and V are a separation of C, which gives me from our last theorem, being a separation is the same thing as saying it's disconnected. That's what our last theorem here said. If you can create a separation on it, it's disconnected. Which gives me that C is disconnected. Contradiction. Because we already assumed C is connected. C is disconnected. Contradiction. Therefore, C has to be a subset of U or C has to be a subset of V. Our connected set has to show up in one or the other. Pretty intuitive there, right? Okay, any questions on this board? All right, let's move over. Ugh, losing my voice. <coughs> <laughs> Okay. Let's, um, that looks good. Okay. <laughs> let C be connected in X and let A be a subset of X where A is sandwiched between C and its closure. So draw a concrete picture. Might be something like this. I may draw a C, there's C, A now might be including some of those points, but not other points. And then C closure would finally be including all the boundary points. So A is a subset of C. Let me draw, imagine all three of these stacked on top of each other, just so that we, uh, let me write it like this one more time. So C might be something like that. A might be something like that. And then C closure might be something like that. But think about all three of those stacked on top of each other. C is a subset of A is a subset of C closure. Something like that. Okay, what are we proving? We're proving that if C is connected, then A also has to be connected. Or in other words, if you've got a set that's connected and you start including its boundary points, you can start including its boundary points as many as you want and it's still going to be connected. So including the boundary points, you're still connected. You're still good. You don't lose connectedness. That's what we're going to prove. Now, we're going to have to use a theorem that we haven't used for a second. It's like theorem 2.5 or 2.6, something like that, that I told you comes up over and over again in this class. And it's what it means for a point to be in the closure of a set. So let me write it in kind of dense language over here. X is in, uh, we'll use A. X is in A closure if and only if for every neighborhood of X, U sub X intersect A is not empty. So that was one way we write it. And I told you that we also think about this in terms of its contrapositive a lot, which is X is not in the closure of A, if and only if, there exists a neighborhood of X, such that when you take that neighborhood of X and you intersect it with A, you do get the empty set. Is this ringing bells? Let me draw one picture really quick. It'd be helpful if we had two colors to think about this. So just thinking about in R2 standard topology, so that our picture makes perfect sense. So here is an example of A. 
Obviously, the closure of A would be what would happen if I included those boundary points, right? So now here's an X. Notice that X is not in A. It's one of the boundary points. Is X in the closure of A? Yeah. Yes, if we were to draw out A's closure, we would capture that point X. So what we showed is X is in the closure of A. If and only if, for any open set you draw around X, you get some of A. There's no way for me to draw an open set around X without getting some of A. So X is in the closure of A, if and only if, for every neighborhood of X, a neighborhood of X was just an open set containing X. If and only if, for every neighborhood of X, when you take that neighborhood and you intersect it with A, you're not empty. Your neighborhood and A have something in common. The contrapositive of that is a point is not in the closure of A. So now, thinking about this way, a point X is not in the closure of A, if and only if I can find some neighborhood. If I can find even one neighborhood of X, such that it doesn't overlap A at all, then that point is not in the closure of A. Okay, so that's a quick refresher of that theorem. Super useful theorem, use it all the time. Going to have to use it here. So, let C be connected in X, and let A as a subset of X, or let A be a subset of X such that A is sandwiched between C and its closure. Then A is connected. So we're going to start this out with maybe reason through this a little bit. What does it mean for A to be connected? It means I can't split it into two open sets. It's really hard mathematically to work with something saying you can't do this with it. How do I start proving things about the fact that I can't do anything with that? So I don't know how to work with the fact that a set is connected. If it's disconnected, I know what to do. If it's disconnected, I know, oh, I have two open sets that form a separation on it, and I can start working with those. But this is telling me A is connected, not that A is disconnected. So this is just me getting into a little bit about how I go, how am I going to prove this? In. So my first thought is, I don't know how to work with A being connected. I know how to work with being disconnected. So I'm going to do, assume by way of contradiction, Assume, by way of contradiction, that A is disconnected. So you might be wondering, how do I know what to do, some proof by contradiction versus just to try to prove it directly? And that's the thinking that goes behind that. What's well, easier to work with, A being connected or A being disconnected? In this case, it's way easier to work with the fact that A is disconnected. That gives me stuff. It gives me a separation on A that I can start using. So that's why I know I'm going to want to do this proof by contradiction. You might think I just have all these proofs memorized ahead of time. I don't. <laughs> I think too how to do it. And so let me in on some of the thinking. Then. Okay, so assume by way of contradiction that A is disconnected. What does it mean for A to be disconnected? That there's two open sets, U and B, that form a separation on A. So then there exists U and B such that they form a separation on A. Okay, so now I've got a separation on A. Now I'm thinking back to our previous theorem. What did our previous theorem say? It said that if you had a connected set as a subset of a set, and you form a separation on this set, your connected set has to show up in U or B. That's what I said over here. We had C was a subset of B, and D, if B was disconnected, then C had to show up in U or C had to show up in B. So since I know C is connected, then I know all of C has to either show up in U or B, because U and B form a separation on A, and C is a subset of A. So, three. Then C is a subset of U, or C is a subset of B, comma, call it U. What do I mean by call it U? Whichever one C is a subset of, we're going to call U. So if C happened to be a subset of B, free label. We call B U, U, B. It doesn't change anything. So just so we can name it. With me? Okay. 
So then, what is our contradiction going to be? I think my contradiction is going to be, I'm going to prove that there's a point in A that's not in C closure. Actually, it's going to be that you're going to prove that C is disconnected. No, I know C shows up in one or the other of these. So I'm now going to show that there's something in A that's not in C closure. A is a subset of C closure. I'm going to show that there's something in A that's not in C closure, contradiction. That's what my contradiction is going to be. Okay, so then C is a subset of U, or C is a subset of E, call it U, comma, and let X in V, pick something out of V. Because V can't be empty, right? So I know that there's something in there. Or, then x is in v, and what is v intersected with c? The empty set. The empty set, because all of c is in u. So c intersected with v is the empty set. So I found an open set containing x, and the open set doesn't overlap c. Then X is not in C's closure. How do I show that something's not in C's closure? I show that there exists an open set containing X where when you intersect it with C, it's empty. So rewriting this in terms of what we showed, I showed X is not in C's closure. How did I do that? I showed that there exists V containing X such that V sub X intersected with C is equal to the empty set. That's why I did. V was the neighborhood of X. So then V is in X and V intersects C is the empty set, which means V is not in the closure. Contradiction. Six. Therefore, A is connected. A being disconnected led to a contradiction, therefore A has to be connected. Because being disconnected led to something impossible. Namely, X being in A and X not being in the closure of C. Because A is a subset of the closure of C. Any questions on that or things that need to explain better? Just need to look at for a sec. <coughs> Um, it's, it's kind of in the middle, and it's not that I didn't understand it, but I'm just kind of curious by how you describe number three when you say, uh, then, then C is in U, or C is in V, call it U. What exactly does that mean, call it U? So, did I say if? No, you, you read right. So I know that C is a subset of U, or C is a subset of V. I'm going to call whichever set C is a subset of U and the other one B. So I'm just relabeling. So if C is a subset of U, then it's not a subset of B. Okay, right. And if C is a subset of E, then it's not a subset of U. So whichever one that C is in, I'm going to call it U. And I'm going to call the other one B. Vice versa. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, so from here on out, I know that C's in U, and it's not in V. Right, okay. Okay, so then I pick something random out of V, little x. I know V's not empty, so just pick something out of there. Now, that little x is something in V, and V and C have nothing in common. Because C was entirely in U. Right. So V is an open set containing X. And when you intersect it with C, you get nothing. Right. Therefore, X cannot be in the closure of C. That's 
That's from this area. Over here, so this is our C. If X were in the closure of C, then any open set containing X would have to intersect C. And since I found an open set, namely V, containing X, that has nothing in common with C, then X cannot be in C's closure. It seems like it could. Because um, it's not... A C's closure is is not in C. It's outside of C, right? C is in C's closure. Yeah. C's closure is not necessarily in C. That's what I'm saying. So C's closure is outside of C. So C's closure is not in C. Well, oh, and okay, so you... Okay, since X is not in U, and U, C is in U, uh, X could not be in C's closure because C is in U. And so I already knew that X wasn't in C. Since I chose my X from V, I already know X isn't in C. So coming to our picture here, I know that X isn't a point like this. Uh, we do not, yes. But X could still be a point like this on the boundary. But, it, but because U... Oh, well, okay, so it seems like it's possible then that X could be in C closure. It could be. Now, here's how we know it's not. The reason I know it's not is that X is in an open set V, and V has nothing in common with C. That's how I know it's not one of these boundary points either. So I know X isn't this point, and I know X isn't this point. So X has to be somewhere out here. Because I can find an open set containing X that has nothing in common with C. Namely V. So our V looked like this. And our U looked like, well, I don't know, because it has all of C. So our U looks something like including going out like that. So getting all of C and coming to its boundary. I still, I don't see how we come to the conclusion intersection of B and C. Oh wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Okay, I, I get the B intersect, or yeah, union of, oh, the intersection of B and C is the only set. I get that. I don't, I still don't see how that can, that proves that X cannot be in the closure of C. So here would be the challenge. So C is some set, we don't know. So C, maybe something like that. Here's C. Yes. X is a point. I don't know where X is. Okay. X, maybe it's right here. Maybe that's my X. Maybe my X is one of these boundary points. Maybe my X is out here. I don't know. Right. But here's what I do know about X. There is some open set containing X that has nothing in common with C. So X can't be here because any open set I draw containing that point, oh, sorry, we were up here. X can't be here because any open set I draw containing that point gets some of C. Okay, we got that part. X can't be on the boundary because any open set I draw containing X would capture some of C. Oh. So X has to be out here, which is completely outside the closure of C. We are setting up an impossible picture. I picked X as a point out of A, which is a subset of C closure, and showed that it can't be in C closure. So in other words, I took a point out of C closure and I showed it's not in C closure, which was our contradiction. Because X was a point in B, V was a separation on A, and A is a subset of C closure. So I grabbed a point out of C closure and proved it wasn't in C closure. Contradiction. of alpha be a collection of connected sets. It's an arbitrary collection. Remember, that's how we write when it's arbitrary. 
Could be infinite, could be one. We don't know. Some collection of connected sets. All right, so let C sub alpha be a collection of connected sets such that when you take the intersection of all the sets, you get the empty set. Sorry, I said that wrong. I thought it right. When you take the intersection of all of them, you don't get the empty set. There's at least one point that shows up in every single one of these connected sets. So in other words, one of these sets could look like this. 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 There's a point that shows up in every single one of those sets. So when you take the intersection of all the sets, you don't get the empty set. They have something in common. Then the union of all those connected sets is connected. So if a bunch of connected sets have any point in common, then the union of all those connected sets is still connected. Make sense? Okay. That's what we're trying to prove next. Okay. So again, I don't really know how to work with the fact that C is connected, so I'm going to assume by way of contradiction that C is disconnected. So one, assume by way of contradiction that C is disconnected. And remember what C is. C is the union of all our connected sets. So you get when you union them all together. That's what C is. C is that. Okay, so assume by way of contradiction that C is disconnected. What do I know if C is disconnected? I can do a separation on it into U and B. Two. Then there exists U and B such that they form a separation, separation on C. Three. I still need to use the fact that these have that all these sets have some point in common. There's at least one thing that shows up in every single one of those connected sets. So I may call that point X. So let X be the point that shows up in the intersection of all these C sub alphas. And note, X is in U or X is in V, comma, call it U. Since X is just some point from C, and U and B are a separation on C, X has to show up in one of those sets. It's either in U and not in B, or it's in B and not in U. Whichever one it shows up in, we're going to call it U. Four. Then, since X is in every single C sub alpha, comma, since X is in every C sub alpha, then every C sub alpha has to be a subset of U. Each C sub alpha is a connected set. And so when you have a separation, each one of your connected sets has to show up in U or V. Can't be both. That's coming back to this one. If you've got a connected set, and it's a subset of the set that you have a separation on, the connected set has to either show up in U or it has to show up in V. It can't show up in both. Since X is in U, then all these connected sets have to be in U. Because X shows up in every single one of them. Every C sub alpha has X in it. Every C sub alpha has to either be in U or V. Can't be both. Since X is in U, every C sub alpha has to be in U. And so then, 
What happens when I union up all the C sub alphas? If every C sub alpha is a subset of U, what happens when I union them all up? You get U, which means that you get... Maybe you don't get all of U, but you for sure get a subset of U. Maybe all of U, but you for sure get a subset of U, right? So then, C, which is a union of all those, is a subset of U. But U and V are a separation on C. Contradiction. So then C is a subset of U, which gives me, maybe make the contradiction more explicit, which gives me V is equal to the empty set. Contradiction. U and V were a separation on C. They split C up into two sets. Some of C had to show up in U, some of C had to show up in V. And then we proved all of C is actually just in U. So C is in both, and C is just in U. Contradiction. Therefore, C is connected. Can't be disconnected. Good? All right, next one. If X and Y are connected, so is the product space X cross Y. If X and Y are connected, so is the product space X cross Y. So one, assume, maybe remind ourselves of the product space. Here's typically how we think about it. Don't think too much into the fact that it's two dimensional, just a picture for intuition. But usually we think when we're doing the cross product of two spaces, we think about this as being the space X, we think about this as being the space Y, and then we think about the whole plane as being the space X cross Y. That's the picture we keep in mind to help us think about these things. But of course, X isn't necessarily the real number line, and Y isn't necessarily the real number line. Just a picture to help us think. So assume X and Y are connected, comma, and observe that X is homeomorphic to, I say, observe that for all little y in big y, X is homeomorphic to X cross little y, and for all little x and big x, y is homeomorphic to the second thing, little x cross y. Okay, let's explain that because a lot going on there. Pictorially first, let's think about x as being r with the standard topology. Over here in this, well, it's not really in the picture, we'll just start right here. Here's x, and it's r with the standard topology. Here's what an open set looks like in x, right? Now imagine I took x, I took every point in x, and I instead crossed it with 2. So now it's like x is right here. Here would be x crossed with 2. If x is a real number line, x crossed with 2 would be this line right here. We just took all the elements in this set, and we just paired them all with the number 2. Okay. Let's go back to a super discrete case here. Here I have A, B, C as my space. Right? Imagine now I replace that, and I said, rather than calling this point A, I'm going to call it the point a comma 2. I may call this point the point B comma 2. I may call this point the point C comma 2. If I just pair every element with 2, it doesn't change my topology. Right? No, it doesn't. Our, our open sets are still the exact same open sets. Instead, my open sets over there containing the points, uh, let's see, there was one that contained A, B. Now it contains A comma 2, B comma 2 doesn't change anything if I just cross it all with the singleton set. 
Our topologies are still the exact same. You just relabeled all the points. Instead of having the points down here, one, two, three, four, five, we instead have one comma two, two comma two, three comma two, four comma two, five comma two. I took everything in X and I just crossed it with two. If you describe those as a set of ordered pairs, uh, I'm assuming that's not the case anymore. This would now be a set of ordered pairs. Oh, it would be. Uh-huh. What I have written over there is exactly what you would get if you took A, B, C, and crossed it with two. You would get A comma two, B comma two, C comma two. Okay. If I took R and crossed it with two, I would get the point of exactly the line that goes through the y-intercept two. You with me? Yep. So it doesn't change the topology on a set to cross it with a single element. It's just like you relabeled all the points, made their name extra long. Instead of having A, you have A2. Instead of having B, you have B2. Instead of having C, you have C2. Okay, so that's what I'm saying here. For any little y and big y, x is homeomorphic to x cross y. That singleton set. That y could have been, if we're thinking about these as r cross r, then that's just some number like 2, 3, 5. Similarly, for all little x and big x, y is homeomorphic to little x cross big y. They have identical topologies. It's just like we relabeled all the points, made their names longer. That's all we really did. Replace all their single replace all their elements with these order pairs. Nothing else changed. Sum so two. Then x cross y and y cross and little x cross big y are connected. for all x and y that you choose. Since x was connected, then x cross y is connected, or x cross little y is connected. Because crossing with a single element doesn't change the topology in any way, shape, or form. Still identical. So then, then, x cross little y union together with, let me write it this way, then for all x in x and for all little y in y, comma, x cross little y union together with little x cross big y is connected. In other words, pick any x and y you want. Let's pretend we're talking about real numbers for a sec. Give me any two real numbers you want, x and y. 32 and 5. So we have 32 and we have 5. What am I saying? I'm saying come over here now. And we're looking at 32 is our x. So we're coming over here to 32 and we're coming up here to 5. Something like that. X cross 30, or y cross 32 is this line. Maybe put the 32 to the side. And uh, x cross 5 is this. So this is y cross 32, x cross 5. x cross 5, y cross 32. Union this set with this set. First off, I know this set is connected because it's homeomorphic to x, which was connected. I know this set is connected because it's homeomorphic to y, which is connected. So this set and this set are connected. And where do they intersect? 532. Yeah, other way around. Oh, other way around. Thank you. 32, 5. So they have a point in common. And if two connected sets have a point in common, then their union is connected. That's what this is. Any arbitrary union of connected sets that have a point in common are connected. So, was there anything special about picking 32 and 5 here? No. We could have done this, this for any little x, and this for any little y. 
They have the point x comma y in common. So for any x and for any y you choose, this union with this is going to be connected because it's going to have the point x comma y in common. Okay, so now we're going to pick a particular x. So we usually use x naught to signify this is a particular x, like 52, 5, 7. It's no longer an arbitrary x, we're actually picking one. Let x naught in x, comma, and observe that do I have enough space here? The union for all y in big Y of the set x cross little y union together with the second thing x naught cross y. Observe that that is connected. So we'll get there in a second. Let's make this make sense. So first off, I pick a random x naught. I know nothing about this x naught. Very saw that. <laughs> Reset my picture here. Okay. So here's my x, here's my y, here's my x. Now, I'm going to pick a random x naught. Doesn't matter which one it is, just pick one. Here's my random x naught. So then, x naught cross y is going to be this line. So this is this set. That's the blue set. Now what am I doing? I'm saying that for every y, for every little y and big y, we're going to take this set and then union it over and over again. So we pick a particular y, and so now we're looking at this set with a particular y. So we pick this y right here. So for our first y, we pick this y. So x cross little y is right here. So here's our little y. x cross little y is right here. x not cross y is right here. You with me? And we already know that that's connected. So I'm going to take that set, and now I'm going to union it with so that is this set right here. I'm now going to union it with what we get for every little y and big y. So I'm going to do this again. This time y is going to be this point. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take this set, union with this set, and I union that with the previous set that I had. So the first set that I had, we'll draw it over here. This was the first set that I had. And now this is the second set that I have. Now I'm unioning those two together. And so now I have two sets that look like that. I'm going to draw them on top of each other. I have that one, and I have this one. Drawing them on top of each other. Now I pick my next y, and I do it again. And I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it for every possible y. And what do I get when I do it for every possible y? I draw a vertical line. You get the entire set. So this is connected and is x cross y. It's the whole thing, x cross y. Okay, so now let's justify really quick how do I know that this is connected. So I know each individual component here is connected, but how do I know that when I picked another y? So here's when I picked one y. Here's when I picked another y. How do I know that when I take this and I union it with that, I'm still connected? Because the x naught is always in their... They always have the blue line. Every single one of these points have this blue line. Every single one of these intersects have this blue line. So they always have those points in common. And so the union of any connected sets that have common points is connected. And so all of x, y has to be connected. That makes sense? And then this generalizes to, there's nothing special about 
uh, doing the cross product of two connected sets, if we would have had x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 xn as all connected sets, then so would their cross product. We would do that with a proof by induction, but I get the feeling that you guys probably aren't very comfortable with proof by induction, so don't let me make a mess of it. You got the main idea, which is this. The cross product of x of x is, is, is arctic, just like x and x and so on. Yeah, because we already know, okay, the cross product of those two are connected. Okay, now it gives me a connected set. Now I cross it with the next set. And I know that the cross product of two connected sets is connected. So it gives me a connected set. Now I cross it with the next one. That's the idea. Oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, you want to keep going? Yeah. Might be a little bit. <laughs> I've had one time I sleep, so if you want to call it, call it the way you go. Okay. We'll call it, but I want to. This is going to be huge for you guys to go back and check out for next time. And that is an equivalence relation. We've already talked about equivalence relations in this class. They're about to come up again, and we're going to be specifically talking about uh, equivalence classes. So we need to remind ourselves of equivalence relations and equivalence classes. I'll go back and I'll find the lecture where we talked about these, and I'll post that as well to Facebook so that you can easily find it. But that's definitely worth reviewing before next time. Because our components, this has all been working up to components. And our components are going to be equivalence classes. So we use connected sets to get components. It's typically the components of a topology that we talk about, not its connected sets. So that's what we're working our way up to. Cool. Okay, so we'll end it there and uh, maybe say this on camera. Starting next week, we're meeting Tuesdays. Okay. Not Wednesdays anymore. So switch into Tuesdays. Are you going to work? Yes, it works for me. Since you're the only ones here, then I'll just worry about if it works for you. Who requested that? Uh, 